Hey, Matthew, I borrowed the link for Dr. from Dr. Kokotos. Perfect. Ah, wonderful. Okay. That was a weird Zoom issue. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Well, we have to credit Dr. Kokotos. The link works fine for me, Dr. Vanna. It's Mike Dwyer. No, no, it doesn't actually. I'm on Dr. Kokotos's link. Okay, understood. I'm gonna see if I can log in as a host and then we should be able to rename the name. Okay, I'm gonna to need to, um, you're gonna to need to disable or allow me to screen share. Otherwise I'm gonna do this acapella. Yes. You're a co-host, you should be able to share now. You see my slides? Yes. It's loaded. Yes, we see it. And Mike, if you want, you can uh, rename Dr. Kokotos as Dr. Cabana. Later tonight. I don't okay. want to be with our president. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, welcome, uh, and good e and good evening to the children's. Welcome to the first. Uh, let me start all over again. Welcome to the Children's Hospital of Montefiore Pediatric Webinar Series. Our first speaker is Dr. Michael Cabana. Dr. Cabana is a professor of pediatrics and the Michael Cohen University Chair of Pediatrics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and physician-in-chief at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore. Dr. Cabana's research focuses on improving the management of common childhood conditions, particularly pediatric asthma. Dr. Cabana is the principal investigator for the trial of infant probiotic supplementation, also known as TIPS, to prevent early markers of asthma, as well as clinical trials focused on infant growth, colic, and asthma, funded by the NIH. Uh, Dr. Cabana previously served on the board of directors of the International Scientific Association of Probiotics and Prebiotics. So uh, to the, today, uh, Dr. Cabana will discuss uh, probiotics in primary care, diarrhea, colic, and eczema, and looking forward to hearing this excellent talk. Thanks, Dr. Kokotos. Thank you for all for joining on a uh, work night. I know you've probably had a busy day at clinic. I will be talking about probiotics in primary care. I myself am a general pediatrician, so I'll be talking about probiotics from a primary point, care point of view. I'll be touching on diarrhea, colic, and eczema, three things that you might see very commonly in primary care. This is part of an ongoing series. The next speaker in March will be Dr. Molly Regelman uh, from the Department from the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes, and she'll be talking about an approach to short stature. Dr. Regelman is uh, one of our associate professors of pediatrics, and she practices in two locations at the Children's Hospital at Montfiore and also at Hartsdale. Um, so another great opportunity for, for continuing CME. Um, so thanks for joining us here in the Bronx at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore. Um, in terms of disclosures, I don't have any financial relationships. My research support is from the NIH, and I do intend to discuss unapproved investigative uses of commercial products. Technically, probiotics are considered a supplement by the United States Food and Drug Administration, and they're not directly regulated. So uh, all of these are considered... Uh, investigative or unapproved by the FDA. However, I will put everything into the context of the current randomized clinical trial knowledge that we have about each of these products. Here are the goals, uh, four or three main goals. Number one, just to go over some definitions. We use these terms loosely, 
They're used a little bit more strict abroad, but we'll go over the definitions for probiotics, for prebiotics, and for symbiotics. We'll also review how to dose over-the-counter probiotics and how to read a label uh, for uh, common probiotics. And then we'll review the current evidence in terms of randomized control trials on the application of probiotics in primary care indications such as diarrhea, colic, and eczema. I'll try and leave time at the end for, for questions, but if you have burning questions, please uh, raise your virtual hand and uh, Dr. Kokotos can tell me if there's a, a burning question. So let's get started with the definitions. Here's the definition from the World Health Organization. Probiotics are defined as live microorganisms when ingested in adequate amounts that confer a beneficial effect to the host. Pretty simple definition. There's three parts to it, and it helps to really break down each component of this definition. I'll start with the last part first. They have to confer a beneficial effect on the host. So. Um, when my kids were in grade school, they had this assignment to come up with oxymorons. Oxymorons are two words that go together that kind of contradict each other, like jumbo shrimp uh, or being awfully nice. Uh, so two words that don't make sense. So if your kids have that same homework assignment, one other oxymoron you can add to that list is ineffective probiotic, because by definition, Probiotics have to be effective. However, the term is very, very loosely used. We investigate whether probiot or whether bacterial strains have probiotic properties and are effective, but probiotics by definition are effective, but the terminology is used very loosely. There are many things in the United States that people slap the term probiotics on, and there has to be randomized control trials that show they're effective before you can technically use them. Here's some things that you can find. Uh, there's a probiotic energy drink. There's probably no randomized control trials about that. If you wanted to indulge yourself, you can have a probiotic chocolate bar down below. And you can even have hummus, hummus that has probiotics in it, but not sure if these have been uh, evaluated in randomized control trials. So please be aware of the use of probiotics. By definition, in the scientific literature, they have to be effective. Second part of the definition, they have to be at, at ingested in adequate amounts. So you've got to know what the specific dose is. If somebody takes some bacteria and just sprinkles it on your food, you do not have probiotic food, you have contaminated food. So it's got to be a bacteria that's beneficial and has to be present in adequate amounts. So just because somebody adds bacteria to a food product, it doesn't make it a probiotic product, and the bacteria has to be present in adequate amounts. The last part here is the term microorganism. So the World Health Organization went out of its way to use the term microorganisms instead of bacteria, and there's a reason for that. So yeast actually, as well as bacteria, have been used as a probiotic supplement, and yeast in some studies have been shown, specific strains have been shown to be effective. For example, Saccharomyces boulardii is a tropical strain of yeast that has been used as a probiotic. It was, uh, it was available and commonly used on, on the West Coast, and it's probably available nationally as well, too. Okay, so there's your definition. Live microorganisms, they have to be ingested in adequate amounts and they have to confer a beneficial effect to the host. Probiotics are not the same as prebiotics, just the difference of one letter in terms of the vowels, but probiotics are not the same as prebiotics. Whereas probiotics are live microorganisms that confer, confer a health benefit to the host, prebiotics are the non-digestible food ingredients. When you take them in, there's no direct benefit to you, but they selectively stimulate the growth of one or a limited number of bacteria in the colon, and those bacteria potentially have health effects, and that's how it improves host health. So it's actually one step removed. So examples of prebiotics are inulin, not insulin, but inulin. Inulin uh, promotes bifidobacteria, which has been shown to have some uh, appropriate uh, positive health properties. There are fructooligosaccharides, FOS, that also are bifidogenic. Um, 
And human breast milk, interestingly, contains a significant level of unique human milk oligosaccharides, similar to fructo oligosaccharides. They are also bifidogenic. That's why the stool of infants who are exclusively breastfed have a lot of bifidobacteria. Uh, so interesting, if your parents ever want to know what the best type of prebiotic is that they should buy, since prebiotics are being marketed to infants, actually breast milk has human milk oligosaccharides that have excellent prebiotic properties. Finally, there's another term called symbiotic. You'll see this used as well, too. That's when a probiotic is combined with a prebiotic in the same product. This is uh, the definition from the International Scientific Association for Probiotics and Prebiotics. So um, it's a mixture comprising of live microorganisms and substrates, that would be the prebiotic, selectively utilized by the host microorganisms, and they confer a health benefit on the host. So you'll see um, infant formulas will have a probiotic as well as a prebiotic added, and it's to create that symbiotic effect there. So those are your terms, probiotic, prebiotic, and symbiotic. And we're going to go to go to some examples about reading labels. So one of the things that you might see is um, different products that are available. These are five products. This is um, about $120 worth of probiotic product right there. So it's very expensive. Here's your scenario. A parent comes to your office with a probiotic supplement and asks you how to read the label. You notice two issues that are inappropriate or incomplete regarding this label. And I'll show you the label, but what are the two issues that you see? So uh, Dr. Kok Kokotos, if you could watch the monitor or people can chime in and try and unmute themselves, but you can type in what you might see. So here it is, probiotic. And this is actually, I found this um, place. It's on East Blaisdell Road in Mill Valley, California. <clears throat> it was a, a physician's office and they were advertising that they had their own proprietary probiotic blend. And here's what the label said. So this is actually something that I found uh, going to a physician's office. Okay, Let's see if there's any comments about this label. Doesn't say how much of anything is in there. Does it? Well, it does. It says uh, 310 milligrams. Uh, how do you feel about that? Don't we need to know how many uh, colony forming units or something like that? There is? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so that's the big issue there. So issue one is it's listed in milligrams. So you do not dose probiotics in, in milligrams. So the appropriate dosing unit for probiotics are colony forming units. So exactly right, or CFUs for short. So a CFU is a measure of the viable number of bacteria. Be wary of products that give you a microscopic count because that includes all cells that are alive. And by definition, probiotics have to be viable. So uh, you're looking for the CFU units. Now, the CFU units are usually dosed um, in exponential numbers. Um, so 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. Uh, so it's uh, it's logarithmic. So here we have l ruteri DSM-17938. It's a common probiotic that's used. And there's your uh, dosing, 1 times 10 to the 8 colony forming units uh, per day. So that's the first thing. And you want to make sure that um, the listing is in CFUs. Okay, so that was one. The other one's a little bit more subtle. Any other comments? Dr. Kokotos, any comments in the... Yes, um, there were two comments. Are they live or professional strength? Uh, yeah. So yeah. So the strength uh, that can be conferred in the CFUs, uh, your hope, you know, by definition, you hope hope they're alive. Uh, they sh the CFUs um, are usually listed in terms of their shelf life as well too. So it's usually guaranteed to have that number of CFUs by the expiration date. So. 
So that, that would all be captured in the CFU issue. So um, already one of our listeners spotted that the milligrams is incorrect. Um, there's a couple other comments. Percent daily value, and then <laughs> what else is in the blend? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so a couple things, the percent daily value, I don't really know if the FDA has a percent daily value. So I'll give you a half a point for that. And it does deal with the, the blend and they're actually missing a little bit of information here. You'll notice that they'll tell you what the blend is. You'll assume it's 20% of each, uh, but it'd be nice if they listed that out. But they give you the name of the genus of the probiotic as well as the species. <clears throat> so Lactobacillus plantarum. Um, but you really need to know additional information. It's really important to know the specific strain of the probiotic. So it's not just the genus, not just the species, but you also need to know the specific strain. So it's actually missing strain specific information. And one strain will have different capabilities or properties than another strain in the same genus and species. So incomplete information on the uh, bacteria, you really need strain level information. And, and just to highlight this, I am actually not a, do not come from a dog family, uh, but this is probably the best way to, to think about this. Um, here are three different dogs um, and they're different strains or different breeds. Uh, I believe that's a St. Bernard on my left. On the right is a German Shepherd. And I think we've got a Chihuahua uh, on top, can somebody confirm? Did I get that right? Okay. Okay, I'm seeing some shaking heads. Did I get it wrong, Dr. Bailey? Okay, Dr. Bailey doesn't know either. All right, uh, let's assume that we got that right. So the point here is different breeds or different strains, but they all actually have the same genus and the same species. They're all Canis familiaris. Same genus, same species. Now, if you need a dog to save you because you're stuck in an avalanche while hiking in the Alps, you want the, the German Shepherd, or excuse me, not the German Shepherd, the St. Bernard uh, to rescue you with a big flask of, of whiskey. If you want uh, something to kind of look cute as an accoutrement to your, um, to your outfit to put in your purse, uh, maybe you might have the Chihuahua. If you want a very vicious uh, guard dog, maybe it's the German Shepherd. So based on the specific indication, or based on the specific task you need the dog to perform, you're gonna choose a different strain or a different breed of Canis familiaris. Same thing with a probiotic. Even if you know the name of the genus and the species, it's not enough. You've gotta know the specific strain or the specific breed of the probiotic. So that's why that complete information is, is really important. So in general, except for a few exceptions, the effects of probiotics are strain specific, it's insufficient information to only include genus and species. And there's a lot of products that do that. So when you try and crosswalk this back to the literature to see if it has any effect, you really need to know that strain information. So here, once again, is l ruteri DSM-17938. We have our dose of one times 10 to the eight colony forming units. And there's our strain number. It's usually a combination of letters and numbers. Sometimes they'll use a trade name as well. Um, but usually it's uh, this sequence as well as here. So you've really got to know the, spe uh, the species or the strain. And here are some other probiotic organisms. Uh, and you'll see that nomenclature, there's the genus, the species, and then the strain that usually follows. Uh, Sarcomyces boulardii uh, usually does not have a strain since it's a, uh, a yeast, okay. Okay, in terms of dose and frequency, Think of probiotics also like antibiotics. There is no standard dose uh, for a probiotic, just like there's no standard dose for an antibiotic. You will dose azithromycin very, very differently than you would penicillin. Um, so no uniform dose depends on the indication and it depends on the strain. And once again, here are some listings of variations in dosing uh, by orders of magnitude based on the strain and the duration and the indication. So these are uh, some examples that show up in the literature here, okay? So many potential mechanisms of action, and this once again goes to the different strains that are being used. Some of the probiotics just compete with other bacteria, competitive 
uh, are, they're competitive and they have a health effect that way. Some affect the metabolism of proteins or bile acids. Some can modulate gut immune function by other ways as well too. Um, so those are the big things. Uh, we talked about definitions. We talked about reading the label. We talked about dosing and let's go into some indications now in the last uh, 30 minutes or so. Okay, here's some pediatric care applications for in the primary care setting where you might encounter or think about using a probiotic. For diarrhea, so I talk about treatment of diarrhea and also antibiotic associated diarrhea, colic, treatment and prevention, and then we'll touch upon eczema in terms of prevention. Okay, let's go to diarrhea. So here's a five-year-old boy with fever, emesis, loose stools, uh, non-bloody. Stools have been going on for one day. You're pretty sure it's a viral gastroenteritis. Uh, what's the evidence about using a probiotic for a viral gastroenteritis? Uh, there's actually pretty a pretty hefty bulk of uh, trials here, 63 trials involving over 8,000 patients, mostly children. And this literature is, has grown actually uh, quite a bit. And the probiotics, the important thing is that they were not associated with adverse effects. And nearly all studies reported a shortened duration of, of diarrhea. So there's uh, different um, meta-analyses that have been uh, published. And here's the one thing um, that you really need to know as a primary care clinician about the use of probiotics. These are different meta-analyses that have looked at the effectiveness of the treatment for different probiotic strains for acute diarrhea, all positive when you combine the clinical trials. But look at the reduction duration in terms of the axis here. It's actually measured in hours and it's actually a pretty modest effect. The average reduction in disease time is only 25 hours. So you've got to really think about whether that 25 hours is enough to make a difference. Maybe for a patient uh, or a family who's about to go on vacation, that's going to make a big deal for them. Uh, maybe if it's a long weekend anyway, and the, uh, the rest of the family is out sick and they don't have anything planned, it might 25 hours might not be a big deal. So there's very good evidence and very strong evidence for the use of specific strains of probiotics in the treatment of viral gastroenteritis. However, the effect is pretty modest. It's only 25 hours. Here's the other thing we're learning about use of uh, probiotics for diarrhea. There is a series of two studies that were published in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine, really beautiful randomized control trials focusing on a specific strain commonly used, lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, also called LGG for short. So that's a specific strain. Beautiful randomized control trial, 943 kids, probably the age group that you might see in your clinics. They're presenting to the emergency department now, and they're randomized to LGG, one times 10 to the 10 colony forming units twice daily, or placebo, duration five days. And the primary outcome, there's three, severity of gastroenteritis, duration of vomiting, and duration of diarrhea. And surprising, actually, there is no difference. So in terms of severity, no difference between the LGG group and placebo, no difference in the mean time to watery stool or the total uh, number of diarrheal episodes. So not statistically significant. And the one thing here to note is the majority of those patients had symptoms greater than 48 hours at the time of randomization. So just by the nature of doing a randomized control trial, these kids are probably gonna present a little bit later in the course of their disease. If the average viral gastroenteritis is only gonna last three days and your effect is probably about 25 hours, if you're starting that late in the game, what we're learning is it's probably not gonna have any effect. So if you're gonna use a probiotic, know that it's gonna have limited effect. The average change in time is about one day and you probably gotta start that pretty early in the course of the illness. So the best common studied scenario actually was rotavirus. Uh, so for viral gastroenteritis, the best studied strains, if you're looking for a strain, is LGG, Enterococcus LAB, SF68, and Saccharomyces boulardii. 
are the best studied strains. Uh, they're safe, but just remember the published effect is only modest 25 hours difference. Recent studies also suggest a limited effect if started after two days of symptoms. So you wanna start early. Let's go to another scenario associated with diarrhea. This is a five-year-old girl with otitis. You're gonna start 10 days of amoxicillin. Should you start a probiotic supplement to prevent antibiotic associated diarrhea? Let's just see a show of hands who might use a probiotic for antibiotic associated diarrhea. I'm seeing some real hands raised, not seeing too many virtual hands. Okay. Dr. Yaku, uh, Alan, I'm seeing your hand up. Okay. All right. Um, let's go through the literature here. This is a really interesting. Um, Topic. So the best systematic review um, that I've seen is by Hempel. This was published a while ago, but I think it's, it stands the test of time. Now, this is one of those situations where the specific probiotic, it, it, all, it all seems to help. What you're seeing here is a forest plot, and you're seeing the line of neutrality right here. And you're seeing the point estimate and the confidence intervals. Each row represents a trial. And if it's showing up to the left side of the screen, it's favoring the probiotic. To the right side, it favors the control. And these open diamonds here are the summary scores. So what you're seeing is um, for a lot of these strains of probiotics, there seems to be a positive effect with preventing antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Now, not every child is going to get antibiotic-associated diarrhea, uh, but it still has a very good number needed to treat. The overall relative risk was 0 0.58. So when you interpret a relative risk, you do it in relation to the number one. If it's less than one, it suggests that the exposure, in this case, the probiotic, decreases uh, the risk of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. If it's greater than one, it increases. So you have a very low relative risk, and um, the number needed to treat is 13. So you'd have to treat 13 kids to see the first effect in, in one child. Not a bad number needed to treat. Usually for the things we do, numbers needed to treat stretch up to as high as 200 to 500. Here's where the art, I think, matches with the science. So we know that it's gonna be pretty effective but the other thing is the parents have to be really motivated to not only follow through with the antibiotic course, but they're also going to have to add something else, add a probiotic to the regimen. So you're complicating things potentially for the parents. And we know that in this chart, as you make the medication schedule more difficult or more complicated, you run the risk of decreasing adherence. So I usually reserve this for parents who are very motivated, uh, parents who maybe had a bad uh, episode with another child previously, uh, but it's really important that they continue and complete the course of antibiotics as well as use the probiotic as well too, because it's only gonna be effective if the parents are using the probiotic on a daily basis during the course of the antibiotics as well as completing the course of antibiotics. So for diarrhea, the prevention of antibiotic-associated diarrhea is well-documented. Uh, once again, the best strains here in pediatrics are LGG and Saccharomyces boulardii, but it's really dependent on patient and parent adherence. So you're gonna have to spend a little bit of extra time making sure that the parents complete the dose co course of antibiotics as well as uh, make sure that it doesn't complicate the regimen too much. Going to switch gears to colic. So this is a five-week-old boy who presents with crying for five hours a day for the last week. Well-fed, seems to be gaining weight. Physical examination, you've done a very careful one in front of the parents. You go through everything and it's negative. And based on the negative history and the exam being negative, you suspect colic. So uh, should you start a probiotic supplement? Let's see a show of hands who would be using a probiotic here. Seeing, uh, okay. 
Dr. Legillo's uh, hand is up. Okay, not a lot of hands here for colic. Okay. Okay, Dr. Dinkovich. Okay. Okay. And do you do you both have experience with um, using probiotics in these indications as well? Okay. See if there's anything in the chat. Assuming. Okay. There were some yeses in the chat. Okay. Good. Uh, so this is a really fascinating part of the literature that's developed in the last uh, 10 years. If I were to give this talk back in um, 2009, 2008, this is where it would end. There's just nothing to talk about. So um, we'll go through the just the definition um, in terms of colic. We'll use the rule of threes here by Wessel. Crying greater than three hours per day, three days a week. Uh, the kids are usually older than three weeks. The infant has to be well-fed and otherwise healthy. So here's the study that came out, I believe this is 2010, by Francesco Savino and his colleagues in Turin. Lactobacillus ruteri DSM-17938 for infantile colic. It's a randomized double-blind controlled placebo-controlled trial. Uh, exclusively breastfed infants with colic were enrolled. The intervention was L. ruteri, 1 times 10 to the 8 CFUs for 21 days versus placebo. And the average outcome was a reduction in crying time to less than three hours per day. Okay, so you'll see in the L. ruteri group an 80% effect right away within day seven, only 38 in the control group, and it persisted, it got up to 96%. So as the placebo group improved slowly, uh, this one was pretty, pretty well sustained. Um, so really, um, a, a big study that's been reproduced a couple times around the world. The Savino study came out in 2010. Hanias uh, Shayuska, who's chair of pediatrics at the University of Warsaw, published a similar study. So here we have a decrease in crying time as well. Same probiotic, same design, same population, same intervention against placebo, decrease in crying time. Um, Kim Chow in Toronto, Sick Kids 2014, randomized control trial, breastfed babies against placebo, decrease in crying time. And then you have the study in Australia uh, by Valerie Sun. Uh, same probiotic, same dosing, slightly longer versus placebo, and it's actually not significant. So this is one of those things that, you know, is kind of a head scratcher. What is it about the Australian babies down in Melbourne that made a difference? Is the microbiome so much that, that much more different uh, south of the equator? Uh, what's, what's going on here? And sometimes these types of studies actually add some additional insight as well. So um, I, I'm a member of the International Scientific Association for Prebiotics and Probiotics. And uh, going to a meeting, um, I noticed that everyone who was appeared in those studies was going to show up to the same session. So I thought, oh, this is going to be an interesting, this could be a, quite a Donnybrook. Uh, or it could be actually a chance to collaborate and think about what we could do uh, together. So we met in Aberdeen in 2014. At the time, I was organizing a similar study in San Francisco. And then we actually met again in Turku in Finland uh, to go through um, uh, some, some data that we had put together for a collaboration. So here was the idea. We put together what was called an um, individual patient data meta-analysis. So it's not your typical meta-analysis. Whereas a meta-analysis will combine results of whole studies with an individual patient data meta-analysis, every principal investigator agrees to contribute the data from each of their studies to an honest broker, in this case, the University of California, and all the data is reanalyzed as individual data. <clears throat> this way, you can control for lots of different factors. So, we knew for each baby what the delivery type was, what the enrollment age was, if there was a family history of allergy, if the method of feeding made a difference. And instead of looking at this lumpy data, you can use this as really fine data to see, well, what was it about those Australian babies that, that made a difference? 
So this is the uh, meta-analysis that we published in uh, pediatrics when, when we all came together. And I'll go through this, uh, these results. So this is the average crying duration by days and treatment groups. So we're looking at crying duration in terms of minutes per day. And then this is the treatment time, day zero, seven, 14, and 21. You'll see up in the upper left-hand corner that we have the two groups that are very similar with crying times greater than 200 minutes per day. My gosh, those poor parents. Okay, so what you start to see right away is there's a drop. So when we combine the data, instead of having four studies with about 50 patients, we now have uh, much bigger studies. We have about 220 patients in each group. You see a drop in the probiotic group right away, and it's actually sustained. So we confirm that there is a difference when we combine the data, but the fun part was when we started doing the multivariate analysis. These are the characteristics of the included trials. So I mentioned the original study in Italy, the Polish study, the Australian study, and the Canada, Canadian study. The Australian study was the one where we didn't see uh, a difference, and they had uh, quite a few more babies here. Here's the three observations that we had when we analyzed the data. The median age of the infants was older, so 7.4 weeks versus four to five weeks. Why does that make a difference? Well, you know, many of these kids are older, we know that colic will self-resolve at about 12 weeks of age. So if, it's, if you're starting the intervention later, there's less time to see that effect. So that was one contributing factor in the multivariate analysis that suggested why this might make a difference. The other thing is when we looked at the records of what those babies were exposed to, they had waited longer because many of them had tried other things. They had started probiotic, they had not started probiotic treatment early, and they might have they were had a greater likelihood of being exposed to other therapies, specifically proton pump inhibitors, interestingly. And, and that change in acid can change the microbiome as well, too. And then the other part was this is the only study where the where there were formula-fed kids. And when you analyze that data separately and pull out the formula fed kids, although you see a difference um, in the breastfed kids, there is no difference in the formula fed kids. So it, it was interesting results, but yet another reason why we should encourage moms to, to breastfeed. So it was a really interesting study to pull together, but for kids with colic, we know a little bit more than those four separate studies now that we've analyzed them this way. So there is actually very good evidence for a specific strain. l ruteri DSM-17938 has actually got three very good randomized control trials that support it. And you'd argue that the Australian study in a way supports it as well too. However, we have a few caveats. It's best used in breastfed infants. There's limited data on formula-fed infants. You don't want these kids also on any GI medications. And it's also helpful if you start the DSM-1793 early in the course of symptoms, hopefully uh, before six weeks of age. So that's the summary for colic. I'll throw in another one with colic here. During a prenatal visit, soon-to-be parents ask you, well, you know, we've read this study by Savino. We have relatives in Italy, and we've heard about this. They ask if they should start a probiotic supplement immediately after birth to prevent colic. Is that advisable? All right, would anyone do that to their families? Prophylactic probiotics to prevent colic in newborns. I'm not seeing too many hands here. Okay. It's actually a study, uh, Flavia Indrio, uh, University of Bari, Southern Italy this time, actually use prophylactic probiotics. So another beautiful randomized, uh, double-blind randomized control trial, this time 554 newborns. Now remember, not every child is gonna develop colic. So the sample size is gonna be incredibly large here, 554 newborns. They're randomized to DSM-17938 early, even before they have symptoms right from birth uh, until they're 90 days of age. 
And crying time at three months of life was lower in the intervention group uh, versus uh, 71 minutes per day. So that's a 38 minute, well, let's see, that's uh, it's about a 30 minute difference per day. So does that make a difference? I've been talking for about 40 minutes. So imagine if I was crying for most of that time, how, how annoying that might be. So 30 minutes might make a big difference. So the question about colic prevention, um, DSM-17938 might be effective in the prevention of colic. I am only aware of one randomized control trial that's looked at it. And when you look at the numbers, the prevalence of colic was very high in that sample, 25%, one in four kids. My best estimates in terms of what I've looked at is that colic is usually nine to 10%, maybe, if you use a strict definition. So that was a pretty high number of kids with colic. And if you're at 10%, you're going to be treating a lot of kids, 90% of infants who really don't necessarily need to be treated. So I would say for colic prevention, there's probably not enough evidence at this point. There's a high economic cost and you have to feel comfortable with treating kids who might not necessarily need that intervention. So uh, not quite ready for prime time is my view here. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up with the last topic. This is probiotics for the primary prevention of atopic dermatitis. So here the mechanism of probiotics I think is, is different. And here there's thoughts that there might be an immune stimulatory function with certain probiotic strains. Um, here I have a very complicated graph or a very busy graph of antigen presenting cells and T helper cells differentiating themselves. There's two types of T helper cells, Th1 and Th2. The Th1 phenotype uh, tends to be associated with fighting infection, whereas the Th2 phenotype is associated with allergic disease. There's certain characteristic cytokines that are released in each of these pathways. But Th1, uh, excuse me, Th2 associated with allergic disease. It's also associated with elevated IgE, eosinophilia, and ATP. So if you're gonna remember the hygiene hypothesis, just remember these three parts. At birth, the Th2 pathway is dominant. So the majority of newborn babies, Th2 pathway is dominant. And then sometime during the first six to 12 months of life, there's usually some sort of infectious exposure, not an infection, but an infectious exposure. And that stimulates the Th1 arm. So it unbalances it or it tips the scale back from Th2 more towards a more balanced Th1 versus Th2. And without that early infectious exposure, it's theorized that the Th1, Th2 balance will stay skewed towards the Th2 dominated arm and you're gonna have a greater likelihood of elevated IgE and A to P later on in life. And that's the hygiene hypothesis, also called the old friends hypothesis. So this is the first trial that came out by Kaliomaki in 2001, published in The Lancet, Probiotics and the Primary Prevention of Atopic Disease. This is a double-blind randomized control trial. They took 159 moms who were pregnant, and in the third trimester, they exposed them to lactobacillus GG prenatally in the last month, and then six months postnatally for the infants. And the results showed a decreased likelihood of atopic eczema in the probiotic group. Relative risk here, 0.51. So once again, lower than one. So it suggests that it decreases the likelihood of the disease. And if you look at the confidence interval, 0.32 to 0.84, both numbers less than one, which suggests that it's statistically significant. Follow-up studies two, four, and actually up to seven years later showed that this effect was sustained. Interesting. So 20 years ago, there's thought that this could be a way to potentially tip the Th2, Th1 balance and help prevent the development of atopic disease. Now, this study was repeated uh, by COP in a very rural area in Germany. Now, COP used half the dose, but he used it twice a day. So a slight difference here. Uh, but whereas there was a decreased risk of atopic dermatitis in the Kaliomaki study, there is no difference 
in atopic dermatitis. And there is actually potentially a larger increase in the number of wheezy bronchitis episodes in the LGG group. So two similar studies with very different results, but done with very different populations. And it's possible that there's other confounding factors. One was that the mean breastfeeding duration in the German study was 9.2 months versus 6.5 months. So you're getting a lot of exposure to prebiotics and the diet is probably very different. Uh, the other, with that exposure and with breast milk, it's possible, well, maybe a probiotic supplement earlier in life won't have that much of an effect or you might not be able to see that effect. So we actually did a similar study. Uh, we used LGG as well. This is a randomized double-blind controlled trial, the trial of infant probiotic supplementation. We also recruited high-risk infants with either a mother or father with asthma. Our primary outcome was eczema. We had some secondary outcomes, but we looked at LGG versus, uh, versus a control. And the infant had to take this with one feeding each day for the first six months of life. A couple things about our population. This is when I was in San Francisco. This is a very, very well-educated group. Uh, the number of moms who had college or graduate school was two-thirds, very well-educated group, and a very affluent group. A majority of the families, uh, at least one-third of the families, were making over $150,000 uh, per year. In terms of other exposures, the C-section rate was actually lower than the national average. It's usually about 32 or 33 percent, so we had a much lower C-section rate. And actually, um, a lot of the babies, uh, about 40 to 43 percent, did not have any formula exposure in the first six months at all. So we had very good breastfeeding rates there, too. So... We looked at the cumulative incidence of eczema. So the way to think about this is we're starting in the lower left-hand corner here. And as we have 92 in each group, and as time progresses, as a child develops eczema, uh, the line's gonna move up. So blue is control and LGG, the intervention is in red. And we start, seeing an increase in eczema over time, there's a slight difference between the control and the intervention that's sustained. However, it's not statistically significant. We only saw about a 7% difference. And to be statistically significant, we would have had to see closer to an 11% difference. So it was in the right direction, but not statistically significant. We tried to look at asthma, uh, but um, the kids weren't quite old enough at that point. And then for rhinitis, there were only nine cases. Uh, looking at the cumulative incidence of asthma, we did see potentially um, a difference between the control and the LGG group. The control group is higher and it's sustained, but it's not that much of a difference. Once again, these kids, uh, I believe we're only five years old. So uh, we're gonna continue to follow these kids to see if there's a difference. Now, when you look at C-section, um, for the kids who are born via vaginal delivery, you're getting exposed to all that vaginal microbiota during the birth canal. But for during a C-section, you're not getting that exposure. And we know kids who are born via C-section have a higher risk, even higher risk for asthma. So we wanted to look at that group as well. And here the control group is in light blue. Our numbers are very small, but we also see potentially some sort of signal here, uh, but it's not statistically significant. The p-value is only 0 0.06. So uh, potentially there's a use uh, for kids born via C-section. So many challenges with prevention studies, uh, multiple confounding factors. Although LGG is best studied, uh, I think the results are pretty much mixed. If you try and break down the studies to see if certain patterns emerge, if you're going to use a probiotic, um, LGG is the best studied. 
but it might have the best effect on those infants whose microbiota might be at most risk, those who are not breastfed, those who are exposed to broad spectrum antibiotics early on in life, and those born via C-section. But right now, really hard to conclude either way. I was just going to leave with some potential aids that you might find useful in your primary care practice or in your subspecialty practice. So this is patient information for busy clinicians. The International Scientific Association of Probiotics and Prebiotics uh, volunteers, uh, it's a volunteer organization, and uh, we have produced uh, some videos at the website. Um, what are fermented foods, for example? Um, what is a probiotic? So they come in different languages. Uh, I think we're up to seven or eight different languages. And it's just spreading information about um, probiotics in, in consumer-friendly ways. There's also infographics that you can download that might be useful. So dispelling myths, uh, probiotic checklist. I think there's even a handout on how to read a probiotic uh, label as well too. So I'll just summarize what we've discussed. We covered a lot of ground. So a probiotic by definition should confer a specific health benefit. Just be aware. So remember that the definition from the World Health Organization, uh, there's no such thing as an ineffective probiotic, but the term is used very loosely in commercial products. Also be aware, beware of claims of gut health or balanced microbiota. No one really knows what a balanced microbiota should look like. It's probably very individualized. Uh, so that's a claim that can be made in just about any direction. I Going through the literature, I wanted to share with you that there is evidence that specific probiotic strains, not just the genus or the species, but the specific strain can be effective for specific indications. And once again, the, the effects tend to be strain specific, not species specific. And in terms of pediatric applications that you might see in your office, we talked about diarrhea, colic, and eczema. For the treatment of diarrhea, it's positive. Um, but <clears throat> remember, uh, the effect is really modest. Uh, it's about uh, 25 hours, and you need to start it relatively quickly. For antibiotic-associated diarrhea, very positive, but it's really dependent on parent and patient adherence. And make sure that it's not affecting the use of the antibiotic. In terms of colic for treatment, it's positive, but remember, it should be started early. Uh, it really only works in kids so far that are breastfed. Uh, you don't want your that child to be on any other medications as well. And then for prevention, maybe promising, but uh, I really wouldn't feel comfortable with treating kids who um, might not necessarily need that. So to do it prophylactically before the start of symptoms seems a little bit aggressive. And then in terms of prevention, I hope I showed you that the results are mixed. Despite the promising study in Finland, it's been hard to duplicate that. There may be specific subsamples or subpopulations of kids at specifically high risk for dysbiosis that might benefit from a probiotic. And uh, there you go. I think I still have a few minutes for questions and happy to take any questions. Thank you. There were some questions in the, in the chat regarding dosing, uh, more for the um, uh, antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Like, what would the dosing be? Sure. Um, you'd have to go to the literature to see what was used. But a couple things with the dosing. Um, I've seen some recommendations where you don't use the adult dose. You you use half, a do half the adult dose for kids and a quarter of the adult or a quarter of the adult dose for infants, you, you don't have to do that. So um, in, in general, you can just use a, a packet of LGG. It comes in a sachet or a, um, a capsule, and, and you can give that same dose to, to a child. The other question that I usually get is, do you have to give the probiotic at a different time of the day than the antibiotic? You, you don't, you can give them uh, back to back. It's probably easier on the parents as well too. Uh, the antibiotic should not affect the probiotic. Any other questions, Dr. Kokotos? Yes, there was a question. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, 
two questions, uh, uh, comment on the use of prebiotics. Uh, that was the first question. And then our, the second question was, um, this is a good one, uh, are probiotics covered by insurance? <laughs> okay, I'll start with the second part first. Um, the answer is no, it's an out-of-pocket expense. So the, um, I, I, at least I haven't found a third-party payer that'll pay for it. So if you're looking at side effects, one of the side effects is probably economic. Uh, you know, a bottle is going to cost about $35. Um, so, so, so yeah, that is a, that is a consideration as well. And the first question, I'm sorry, was, um, about was, the use of, uh, prebiotics when, well, when, yeah, that's a good question. So the use of prebiotics is similar to, uh, probiotics. You'd need to know what the specific indication is. I think prebiotics might be more acceptable to families in terms of prevention. Um, so I've seen prebiotics used, for, for example, in daycare settings. So kids going to daycare for the first time um, might be at higher risk for diarrheal disease. Uh, and I've seen probiotic, or excuse me, prebiotics used as a supplement to prevent that. But um, there's no real easy prebiotic that's available um, over over the counter, they're usually given with with something else. Uh, at least I haven't found something that's that's convenient, or it's it's given in a yogurt or a food stuff in clinical trials. So I'm not sure how helpful that is. One other comment: uh, uh, VSL dash three sometimes co is covered in sachet versus capsules. Okay, great. That's helpful information. Oh, does it have to be uh, refrigerated, the probiotic? Yeah, um, well, I would, great question. I, I would probably follow as much as possible the, um, the recommendations by the manufacturer. The, the biggest issue is actually exposure to moisture. So you'll see some of the probiotics individually wrapped, and it's actually more important to keep them away from, a, keep moisture out, uh, keep them away from moist environments. Uh, but there are some probiotics they suggest to refrigerate. I don't think I've seen any problems with that. If, if you know, I, I think you just need to keep it in a cool place, but it's really the moisture that I think is a bigger issue. Uh, there was one other question on what do you think of fortified formula? Uh, fortified fortified formula, formula, I guess, with pre uh, probiotics. Um, so, well, breastfeeding is always best. Um, I, I actually think it's hard to find a formula. There's so many formulas now that are fortified and they keep changing. Um, it, it depends on what you're looking at. So if you're trying to prevent eczema, what I've been most impressed with is the protein that's used. Uh, for example, cow's milk protein, for a family that's atopic and you're using regular cow's milk protein, formula, it'll probably increase the risk of eczema. You probably want a partially hydrolyzed whey formula or an extensively hydrolyzed casein formula. So for, for me, unless you're from Finland, um, uh, the protein type makes a difference uh, more than the probiotic. That's my read of the literature. So um, so I'll just use some trade names here because it's a little bit easier. Carnation Good Start Supreme is a partially hydrolyzed whey formula that shows a reduction in eczema. And uh, I believe it's Nutramagen. Uh, that's the extensively hydrolyzed casein formula. And for good measure, it's got some LGG in it as well too. Um, so, so maybe that's your best bet. You're covering both, both, uh, both items there. Uh, Dr. Kokotos, I often get asked, well, what about uh, yogurt? Can you use yogurt to prevent antibiotic-associated diarrhea? Okay, so here's the thing about yogurt. Um, if it's made in the United States, yogurt does not necessarily have to contain live cultures. If, if you're in Europe, yogurt, by definition, has, has to contain live and active cultures. So if you're going to use yogurt, make sure there's live and active cultures. Here's the other thing that's an issue with yogurt. Yogurt can contain anywhere from 10 to the four to 10 to the seven 
colony forming units of two types of bacteria, Lactobacillus bulgaricus and Streptothermophilus. So they both have probiotic properties and they can prevent antibiotic associated diarrhea. But here's the thing, 10 to the four to 10 to the seven, you probably get an effect at 10 to the seven. And to be sure you should really be at 10 to the eight. But to get to 10 to the eight, you've got to eat 10 of those yogurts to get to that level, to be sure. 10 to the seven is probably fine, but because the shelf life can change the number of uh, live and active cultures, you can't really control um, the amount of bacteria or probiotic you're being exposed to. That's the tricky thing with yogurt. There's probably some dose response and you're probably getting some marginal effect, but you can get a much more concentrated dose when it's given as a supplement. But if a family has yogurt and it's got live and active cultures, it's probably worth a shot uh, if they can't run out to get their probiotic. So that's the trade-off with yogurt. It's probably more holistic and um, provides better nutrition overall than a supplement, but it can't necessarily deliver a consistent or high dose. I think I have time for one more question. Anything else? Yeah, there were a two. Well, there's a comment about uh, fermented milks like kefir for diarrhea. And uh, what do you think about combination vitamin D and probiotics for babies? So mm -hmm. two, those the last two comments. Uh, kefir, I actually haven't done a lot. I, I suspect that um, the, the live bacteria might have an effect, but I, I'm not sure. I haven't studied that. For vitamin D, I've, I've studied vitamin D in terms of the treatment of asthma and preventing asthma exacerbation. So I do know that um, one randomized control trial we did for kids with asthma, giving high dose uh, vitamin D, uh, 2000 international units uh, per day. Uh, unfortunately, there was, there was, there was no effect. Um, so can't talk about the combination of vitamin D and uh, probiotics, but um, there's a lot more work to be done, that's for sure. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for, for joining, especially on a night where the State of the Union is on, especially also after a long day in clinic. Uh, here is the uh, code that you can use to get CME credit. The code when they ask you for it is 91SCAG. And um, look forward to any feedback. Um, my email, if you want to send me questions, is mcabana at montefiore.org. Please feel free to uh, send me any questions and look forward to seeing you on the next uh, webinar, which will be in March with Dr. Regelman to talk about short stature. So thank you for joining us and have a good night.